This lecture is part of a series of lectures for a course entitled The Physics of Diagnostic Radiology. The second lecture, MRI Contrast and Spin Echoes, is broken down into four parts. Lecture 1, Part 1, covers image contrast. At the end of this module, you should reach the following learning objectives. To be able to compare the importance of image contrast to image pixel intensity in MRI. To list three or more tissue properties upon which MRI contrast depends. To appreciate how resolution, SNR, and object size impact feature conspicuity. To recognize the importance of the block equations and the role of each term. And to understand the solutions to the block equations during free precession. Image contrast. Why do we care about image contrast? Well, it turns out that the human visual system is much more sensitive to contrast, that is, differences in signal intensities between adjacent regions or tissues. Uh, than we are to absolute luminance. That is, MRI systems do not measure absolute signal intensity very well. Uh, and this becomes really important in our understanding of MRI. It's not sensitive in the way uh, that a PET detector is to counting photons. Uh, at the end of the day, what we ultimately have is voltage signals that we transform into images, wherein the contrast information is especially valuable, but the absolute signal intensity information uh, currently has limited meaning in MR. So why do we care about image contrast? Well, humans perceive image contrast much better than luminance. And as MR right now, uh, certainly diagnostic radiology is largely a qualitative art, that is very well-trained expert radiologists learn to interpret uh, imaging features uh, as, as experts, uh, it becomes important to understand uh, image contrast and mechanisms of generating image contrast in MR. Now, to prove the point that as humans, we're best at perceiving contrast better than luminance, we have here an unusual checkerboard pattern with uh, a shading uh, across it cast from this green cylinder. And you could ask the question of, about whether the luminance of A, that is the brightness of A, is greater than, less than, or equal to the luminance of B. And in looking at this, uh, albeit optical illusion, most people are inclined to say that the brightness or the luminance of B, of course, is above that of A, B being a, a bright or white square, and A being a dark or uh, gray square. Uh, but what we actually find, in fact, is that the luminance is, is the same. So we cover up region B with a swath of gray and slide that swath over to uh, uh, covering B and slide it over to cover A, and you know, we can now identify that, in fact, the luminance of A and B are absolutely the same. So again, as humans, we don't perceive luminance differences uh, very well, but we do, or absolute luminance very well, but we do perceive contrast differences uh, quite well. So when it comes to imaging and imaging systems, we can make a basic definition for contrast. And that is to say that the contrast between tissue A and tissue B, we can define as the absolute value of the uh, image intensity in say pixel A or tissue A minus the, uh, the image intensity in pixel B divided by some reference signal. And that reference signal could be the signal intensity of region A or of region B or of their average or of some background signal. It doesn't matter. The principal measure of a uh, principal thing that underlies a contrast measurement is the difference in signal intensity between two regions. Now, when it comes to MRI, what we find is that the contrast between two tissues, tissue A and tissue B, is a function of many things. It can be a function of the proton density, that is the absolute density of hydrogen nuclei uh, that we actually are imaging. It's going to be low in some tissues like lung and air spaces and much higher in most soft tissues. It also depends on some imaging properties that are very specific to MR. That is the longitudinal relaxation, T1, and two different transverse relaxation components, what we call T2 and T2 star. And we'll discuss these parameters uh, shortly uh, and get into them further in a subsequent lecture. Uh, but these are critical NMR relaxation properties that are tissue specific. So white matter, gray matter, uh, liver, spleen, muscle, fat, all have different T1s and T2s, and, and consequently they underlie the ability to generate image contrast between soft tissues and MR.
And it turns out uh, MR is a very rich imaging modality and can in fact be made sensitive to molecular diffusion, for example, and many and several other things, uh, susceptibility, uh, perfusion, uh, the presence or absence of contrast agent, which actually affects these relaxation properties, and even more and more things. So what's complicated in MR is that fundamentally the contrast itself can depend somehow or does depend somehow on all of these possible different uh, tissue properties. And the goal of much of MRI is uh, to design MRI sequences to isolate image contrast from a single NMR property. And it's not obvious how we could do that, but what we would like to be able to do is have image contrast depend on something that's a function of really just the T1. That is to say, if the tissue has a range, or if the subject or object you're imaging has a range of proton densities or T2s, you're uh, invariant of that, and you become a function of only T1. And we will get into the details of how we do that later, but the idea is that we can manipulate the pulse sequences, the RF pulses and gradients that we use in generating an MR image, such that the contrast becomes a function almost exclusively of T1 differences between tissues. And through making other changes and differences, uh, tweaks, if you will, to the pulse sequence uh, or the protocol that we're running on the scanner, we can make it the case that the contrast is heavily dependent uh, on something as a function of just T2. And in doing so, we can generate a T1 weighted image or a T2 weighted image. And the impact of these other tissue properties on the underlying contrast uh, in the observed image uh, can be suppressed uh, such that it becomes almost irrelevant. So we care not just about contrast, but we care about contrast in the presence of noise because our images, of course, uh, are never going to be perfect. And so this is a simple uh, simulation that demonstrates uh, different object sizes, so large objects to small objects, and different degrees of contrast relative to the background. And this on the left-hand side is the noise-free image. And then, of course, we can add uh, MR-type uh, noise to the images. And we observe something that's not terribly surprising, but it points out that large, high-contrast objects are easier to see in the presence of noise. So large, high-contrast objects stand out. And as the contrast diminishes, it becomes difficult to detect these objects. And of course, as the feature size is dropping, it also becomes difficult to detect and more difficult to detect smaller objects than larger objects. Uh, not stating anything there that's not uh, probably obvious to you, but putting it here in a more clear context. Uh, what might not be uh, quite as obvious is the impact of resolution uh, that resolution has on our ability as, as visual observers uh, or even computer-aided detectors uh, to identify smaller objects or low-contrast objects. So here on the left-hand side, we have high-resolution imaging. The signal-to-noise is kept constant across these different uh, images that are being shown. And uh, the point here is that small, low-contrast objects are easier to see with higher resolution. So we always prefer high-resolution images. We can see these small uh, and even relatively low contrast objects as being perceptible in the high resolution image, but imperceptible on a much lower resolution image. And in fact, even large objects can be difficult to see in a low resolution image. Uh, so again, uh, while there's an interest and a motivation to obtain and acquire high resolution images, uh, that of course isn't always practical when it comes to MR, because high resolution is expensive, so to speak. It costs us time, uh, and, and in that sense may cost money uh, to obtain really high resolution images in clinical subjects or in research studies. Uh, we'll talk more about what that expense looks like in later lectures. So what is it that fundamentally underlies contrast in an MR uh, experiment? It's the Bloch equations. So these uh, nice and handsome gentlemen were awarded the 1952 prize, uh, Nobel Prize in Physics for their development of new methods for nuclear magnetic precision measurements and discoveries in connection therewith. So we have uh, Felix Bloch here on the left-hand side and Ed Purcell here uh, on the right-hand side. And together, they are uh, fundamentally responsible for describing a set of um, uh, equations that help us understand the NMR experiment. And they look as follows. What we're describing here is the time rate of change of the bulk magnetization. So the bulk magnetization stands in as a proxy for the apparent magnetization that's, that arises from having you know, billions and billions of spins uh, coordinated through uh, the polarization of a large external magnetic field. Uh, 
And so what we learn through the block equations, which are really phenomenological equations when it gets to the relaxation terms, uh, but this set of this complicated set of equations describes for us how the bulk magnetization will change as a function of time. And what we notice here in the first term is that the bulk magnetization in the presence of a magnetic field, uh, a B field, given a specific gyromagnetic ratio, will give rise to precession. And so this term here uh, uh, def defines, if you will, uh, the, the, the idea that spins will precess in a large externally applied B0 field. Now, other terms that are less obvious uh, and arise to, to describe what's observed in experiments uh, are as follows. Here we have the components of just the transverse magnetization, so just the X and Y magnetization divided by T2, and we describe this as transverse relaxation. It's the rate at which the transverse magnetization decays according to the transverse magnetization decay constant T2. Uh, and this is magnetization that only decays, only disappears, uh, if you will. And we'll see that as we look at solutions to the set of differential equations later. And on uh, this uh, right-hand side term here, we see just the MZ magnetization and what we call the equilibrium level of magnetization. This is uh, the most magnetization you can have at thermal equilibrium, if you will. And this term describes longitudinal relaxation and its dependence on the longitudinal relaxation time constant, T1. And there's other terms. As we mentioned before, we could in fact have uh, uh, diffusion dependence here. Uh, we won't uh, get into the details of this term, but it's just, uh, just to uh, identify for us that in fact there are other uh, uh, terms that could be included to account for other phenomena in the NMR experiment. So again, the first term rep uh, represents precession, and we'll notice that the magnitude of the bulk magnetization is not changed by that particular term. And the phase of the rotation of the bulk magnetization changes due to the externally applied B field. And the second terms uh, and third terms are relaxation terms. And the T1 changes are slow. They're on the order of hundreds of milliseconds, uh, meaning that the T1 time constants are on the order of hundreds of milliseconds, even thousands. And the T2 changes are fast on the order of tens of milliseconds, maybe 100 or uh, more milliseconds. Uh, and interestingly, the magnitude of the bulk magnetization as a consequence of relaxation can in fact be zero. That's not obvious, uh, but what it says is that the bulk magnetization vector is not a vector of constant magnitude, and we can manipulate its magnitude in a way that depends on the underlying T1 or T2, and that's the principle by which we can manipulate image contrast in an image. We can change the magnitude of the bulk magnetization vector for different tissues, for different T1s, different T2s. And this last term uh, just expresses that spins are thermodynamically driven to exchange positions. Uh, spins bounce and move around as long as we're above zero Kelvin. We won't get into the details of that particular expression, but again, it just helps us understand that there are ways of capturing even more complex spin physics uh, if uh, the conditions uh, require that. So this expression here describes uh, the MZ magnetization during a period of what we call free precession. And we'll make a distinction later between free precession and forced precession. But free precession is what happens to the spin system as it works towards achieving equilibrium in the presence of just the externally applied B field. That is, no other magnetic field gradients are turned on at that point in time. We can, as we'll learn later, also force precession. We can force the spin system to do something, principally through the application of RF pulses. So that block equation under certain conditions can be solved analytically to produce this expression, which tells us that the, the MZ magnetization as a function of time behaves as follows. This term here identifies the initial longitudinal magnetization. That is to say that after some experiment is performed, uh, a series of RF pulses, for example, you will have a magnitude or, or an amount of MZ magnetization that at that point we refer to as the initial magnetization. This is right after some series of RF events. That so-called prepared magnetization will in fact decay as a function of time in a, in, uh, and as a consequence of the underlying tissues T1. And so this term really represents the decay of some initial condition. Having perturbed the system, 
the system now freely precesses. And this term here, because it's an exponential decay term, means that there's some mz0 term that's going to decay eventually to zero, depending on what the t1 value is. This is just one component of what happens to the mz magnetization. The other component is a return to equilibrium, uh, this whole expression here. And this term here uh, in the very beginning is the equilibrium value of the magnetization. So under perfect equilibrium, as time goes to infinity for both, to, both of these conditions, what we're left with is just this m naught term, the equilibrium value uh, or level of magnetization. And so this term as a, as a um, return to equilibrium exponential function just returns back towards some baseline value. And it's not obvious that these are the consequences of the earlier uh, block equations, and it takes more work to sort of develop that. But these are very useful expressions for understanding what happens at a longitudinal magnetization uh, after the system's been perturbed by, for example, an RF pulse. So we should also consider what happens to the transverse magnetization, and it looks similar, but a little bit simpler. And the transverse magnetization as a function of, con of time looks as follows. We'll have some initial transverse magnetization. That is to say, after the application of an RF pulse, we could have some transverse magnetization, uh, some presumably non-zero uh, level of transverse magnetization. But that transverse magnetization is only susceptible to decay. It's only going to decay as a function of time and the underlying tissue is T2. And so this initial uh, condition uh, is a decay condition that decays down from some, from some uh, state after uh, the perturbation by an RF pulse down towards zero. So this expression describes the transverse magnetization during a period of free precession. Uh, this is what happens to the transverse magnetization after it's been acted on by a series of RF pulses. So here, taken into combination, we can see the effects of excitation and relaxation excitation produces transverse magnetization, but when the RF pulse is turned off, then the magnetization will return again to its equilibrium value. So we can start this over again and see the process of excitation. RF pulse, RF energy is put into the system until the spins tip over into the transverse plane. They precess around, but of course want to return back to their equilibrium position uh, through the the relaxation equations of free precession that we just showed you. So after excitation, which is really forced precession, the magnetization relaxes during so-called free precession. And the set of spins that we just showed you here uh, might stand in for a set of spins that uh, comprise, say, an axial image through uh, the subject's chest. Okay, thank you. That completes this module, and we'll return to some new material in the next lecture.